Welcome back. So today we're continuing this lecture series on reinforcement learning, which is one of my favorite topics at the intersection of control theory and machine learning. And actually also at the intersection of biological learning. So a really, really old, rich topic, um, decades of development, and especially recently there's a lot of renewed interest in reinforcement learning because of uh, its combination with deep neural networks. And so today I'm going to focus primarily on model-free reinforcement learning uh, and specifically on gradient-free methods. So this lecture is going to culminate in uh, Q-learning, which is one of the most popular reinforcement learning techniques uh, available today. So that's this Q-learning here, which is an off-policy gradient-free method. And to build up to Q-learning, we're going to have to introduce some concepts like Monte Carlo learning uh, and temporal difference learning. And TD learning, especially temporal difference learning, has really deep connections uh, to biological learning, how we actually learn uh, in our kind of uh, coupled network of, of neurons. So I'm really excited. I think this is going to be a pretty neat lecture. Uh, and just a reminder, this is roughly following a new chapter in the second edition of our book, uh, Data Driven Science and Engineering. So this is a chapter I put together kind of to be the, the end cap of the control section because reinforcement learning really is such a, an exciting uh, kind of a, uh, growing set of techniques. Okay, good. So model-free reinforcement learning, specifically gradient-free methods today. Now, before uh, jumping into kind of all of the, the gradient-free optimizations I'm going to talk about, which is going to culminate in Q-learning, I want to introduce or kind of recap a couple of topics that we talked about in the last few uh, video lectures. So the first thing that is really important is just to remind you uh, that there exists this quality function Q, which essentially tells you the joint quality or value of taking uh, an action A given a, a current state S. So the value function V tells you uh, what the value of being in a current state S is, assuming you take the best action. This quality function is somehow richer and it in contains more information about what is the quality of being in this state uh, S for any action I might take. So this is the joint uh, quality function is kind of sometimes what we call it. And this quality function can be defined using kind of the standard um, Markov decision process MDP language that we've also introduced, where it is the expected future reward uh, given that I am in a state S now and I take an action A. So it is the expected reward function uh, currently, the, the, the instantaneous reward I'm going to get taking action A now, which will lead me to state S prime, plus any future rewards that I might get uh, just for being in that next state S prime. Okay, so we, we talked a lot about this in the last lecture. And this is essentially just saying that the, uh, the, the quality of being in a state now is my expected current reward plus all of my future rewards for being in the next state that I'm going to jump to. Uh, and you can write it out in terms of this summation over probabilities because this Markov decision process, this MDP, which is kind of the cornerstone of uh, a lot of reinforcement learning algorithms, assumes that your environment, the, the environment that you find yourself in, evolves probabilistically. So there's kind of a coin flip uh, randomness element to how the state evolves even given uh, the same action. So even if I take the same action in the same state, I might have different uh, future states according to some probability. And that's given by this function P. So S prime again is my future state, uh, S is my current state, and A is my current action. And so this expected value here has to be summed up over all of the possible future states S prime I might find myself in, which are given by this model, this, this uh, probabilistic evolution P. So right off the bat, what I want to point out, and this is why uh, we need this lecture that I'm going to give you today, is that all of the learning that we, we um, have demonstrated kind of uh, using the Bellman equation and dynamic programming up until now, so policy iteration and value iteration, Assume that you have a model for this uh, P, this probabilistic Markov decision process that evolves your, your system forward in time. And we also assume that we have a model for this reward function. And you can then optimize uh, using this knowledge. 
And if you have this quality function, remember that you can derive uh, the value function at a state s. It's simply the best possible action you could take. It's the quality uh, for the best action a you could take. And similarly, you can derive the optimal policy pi. It's simply the a that maximizes the quality function. It's the action a that maximizes the quality function. But again, the central challenge, what we talked about in the past lecture, was dynamic programming uh, using Bellman optimality when we actually have a model for P and for R, when we have a model for how the system evolves and what the reward is as a function of the state and action. But in many systems, we don't actually know how the system is going to evolve. We don't have a model for that. And we don't know what the reward function is or what the reward structure is before kind of exploring and trying things out. So that's going to be the motivation for these um, kind of uh, model-free reinforcement learning algorithms I'm going to talk about today. So this is just a recap. I wanted you to remember the quality function is really important. We also have a value function and a policy pi. And again, you know, if I had a model for P and I had a model for R, I could run through this value iteration where I would uh, essentially take actions that maximize my value and I would update my value function uh, at every state that I evolve on, on some uh, trajectory. So let's say I'm playing chess. I would just play chess over and over and over again. And every state I find myself in, I would use my best uh, policy to get my best action A and I would somehow update the value at my uh, current state S using the new reward information uh, that I get. So uh, this all relies on, on Bellman's equation. But we're going to talk about today when we don't actually have access to a model. So when we don't have access to a model for how the system evolves or what the reward structure is, we essentially are stuck using trial and error learning. And that makes a lot of sense in a lot of biological situations too. Right? The first time that you play tic-tac-toe, maybe the person that taught you told you, you know, that three X's in a row wins or three O's in a row wins, but they didn't tell you what the value uh, of a particular state was, and they didn't give you a model or a rule for how this game is going to unfold. You just had to play a bunch of games, learn the rules, and learn the reward structure. Okay? And so the simplest approach, and I don't actually really recommend doing Monte Carlo learning uh, unless you have to, but this is almost to illustrate the simplest approach uh, to model-free learning, learning purely from trial and error, is called Monte Carlo learning. And so in Monte Carlo learning, what we're going to first do uh, is define this, this cumulative reward function. So Monte Carlo learning is what's called an episodic learning algorithm which means that it needs to run an entire episode, uh, many, many states uh, action sequence, leading to some final end of the game uh, before it can, it can use that information for learning. And so Monte Carlo learning works you know, in theory for things like games that have a definitive end. Or maybe if you're trying to make a, a racer, you know, a bipedal walker race to a finish line, that would have a definitive end uh, for that, that episode as well. And so what you do is you essentially you pick some policy and you enact that policy and you run through your game. You play your game of chess or you run your race and you compute your cumulative total rewards, of course, discounted by this gamma. We always discount by gamma because that's how we can prove optimality in certain uh, conditions. And so based on this total cumulative reward, the simplest thing we could possibly do is take and divvy up that reward equally among every state that, uh, that my system took on the way to the finish line. Okay, so that, uh, I'm gonna demonstrate this for, for value function learning, and it can also be done for Q learning. And so essentially what we would do is at the end of an episode, once we've computed this cumulative reward, how much did I gain over that episode? I would say that my, my new value function at every single state along the way is equal to my old value function, plus I essentially take and I add a little bit of this r sigma divided by how many steps there were in my, uh, in my trajectory to my, my value function. So this is essentially an update that says that we're, our best estimate for our value function is still kind of the old value function, but any states that we we uh, hit along the way to the finish line, we are going to add 
the cumulative reward divided by the total number of steps. Now, this is a very inefficient way of learning. You have to play tons and tons and tons of games of chess or tic-tac-toe uh, to actually learn this way because what you're assuming is that every single step you took along the way to victory is equally important, uh, to victory or loss is equally important. So for example, if I played a brilliant game of chess and then I made a bad move at the end, all of those moves would be considered equal in this scheme. Or if I played a bad game of chess at the first game and then my opponent got unlucky <laughs> and, I, and lost, then I would actually weight all of those bad moves uh, towards, towards this updated value function. But again, this is the simplest, kind of most uh, common sense thing you could do to start accumulating that information you've uh, experienced. So this is the experienced reward and you just divvy it up over every single step you took to get that reward. Okay, that's, uh, that's what Monte Carlo learning is. And you can uh, do the same thing for Q learning. So you can also update your quality function in exactly the same way, where basically uh, every state action pair that you, uh, you saw along, along the, the trajectory that you just played would get updated again by um, a small amount uh, given by this reward divided by N. Okay, and you can kind of convince yourself that this should be, you know, uh, an, an optimizer. This should actually converge under certain conditions. Okay, um, and we're only updating based on the difference between the reward and the old value function, or the reward and the old Q function, because if my old value function or Q function were perfect, then they would perfectly predict what this future reward would be. So if I had a perfect value function, this would actually be, this difference would be zero here and zero here. So uh, that, that's why we're kind of updating with the difference between the actual reward and the estimated reward. Because that's kind of what this is. This uh, V old and this Q old here are essentially my estimated future reward being in state SK. Okay, good, that's Monte Carlo learning, uh, relatively inefficient. But one of the nice things about it is that it has no bias, okay? So it's very, very sample inefficient. I don't recommend doing this in practice, but it, has, it introduces no bias uh, into the learning procedure. If you play enough games, in principle, this should, uh, this should converge. And you should do a thought experiment of whether or not we should be enacting our optimal policy pi or a suboptimal policy. Uh, if I was doing this, I would always be op uh, enacting my optimal policy pi um, kind of based on my new either Q function or, or value function. But I want you to think through what would happen if you didn't enact an optimal policy pi. Okay, good. So that's Monte Carlo learning, and that's kind of one uh, extreme. And on the other extreme is what we have uh, called temporal difference learning. And TD learning is one of the most important advances that has happened in reinforcement learning. This is decades old, and it gives us a better strategy in many cases for learning that essentially uh, it highlights events that are more recently uh, giving me rewards. So I have some state action sequence and I have some rewards I've gotten along the way. And to some extent I wanna say that maybe the events that happen more recently are somehow related to the rewards I'm getting. And so that kind of difference in time uh, is, is also a, a property of biological learning systems. So if you think about Pavlov's dog, right? Pavlov's dog was conditioned to expect a food reward at some point after hearing this bell ring. And so if you ring the bell, you know, the dog starts to salivate. And so there is a finite difference in time between the action or the state, the environmental cue, and the actual expected reward. So in Monte Carlo learning, you're basically saying that the right action could have happened at any point in the past leading up to the reward now. What temporal difference learning does is it says there is kind of an optimal time in the past where I am most likely to be correlated with a current reward. And that's a tunable parameter I'll, I'll tell you about. Okay, so I'm gonna start with something called TD0. There's a whole family of temporal difference learning algorithms. We're gonna start with the kind of zeroth uh, model here. And again, we're going to uh, start by looking at this in a, a value function formulation. So remember that the value function at a state now, so subscript k means at time k, 
So the value function at my, my state now at time k is given by my expected reward now, rk, plus a discounted value function at the next state I find myself at, sk plus 1. Okay? Uh, and this is um, Bellman's optimality condition, essentially that this can be written recursively. So the value function now can be recursively written in terms of the value function at the next state I find myself in. And so what temporal difference learning does, this is a different than Monte Carlo learning, is that it updates the value function at my state sk. And again, it similarly starts with my old value function, and there is a correction term. And what that correction term does is instead of averaging over all of the trajectory, like what Monte Carlo learning does, in TD learning, we have this, uh, this first term here called the TD target estimate. And this, if you look, this term here is almost exactly uh, the expected value function, okay? So this term here is what I expect my value to be given a state SK. And I take its difference with the old estimate of my value function at SK. So this is my, my old best estimate of the value of being in the current state now. And this is new information of what actually happened. So I, I take an action, I get a reward RK, and I find myself in a new state SK plus 1, where I have an estimate of the value function. So this right here is my expected value be of being at point SK. So I, I want to say that again. This is really important, and it's a little confusing. Because of the Bellman optimality condition here, where the value of being in a state at time now is equal to my reward now plus a discounted value at being in the state the next time step into the future, I can essentially say that my, my estimate of my value function should look like my current reward plus gamma times my next value function at the next state. But if I actually am playing a trial and error game, if I'm playing a game of chess using my supposedly best policy pi, I can actually take that step to sk plus 1. I can get a reward or lose a reward, whatever, and I can compute what this actual uh, cumulative, um, we call it r sigma, the cumulative reward is. And if there's a discrepancy between my, my actual r sigma and my estimated uh, value, then I will update my value function uh, with some weight alpha here, okay? So this is, in, in some sense, it has the same flavor of the Monte Carlo learning. I start with my old value function, and I'm iterating to find a new value function every time I take a step. I'm iterating this. But now I'm using this kind of uh, Bellman nested uh, reward r sigma to, to update. And so this is called the TD target. And this is called the TD error, the temporal difference error. And it's kind of interesting. So there is actually evidence that um, there are analogs of this in neuroscience. So when you know, cells kind of fire together, wire together, that's, um, that, that's one of the principles of neuroscience. And dopamine, when dopamine is released, it can strengthen connections. Um, between the, the cells that fired together right before dopamine was released, those cells will strengthen uh, their, their correlation of firing together. And so there is a lot of really interesting theory and experiments that kind of connect uh, these TD error signals and the release of dopamine in actual biological systems. So it's believed that there are circuits in your brain and in your nervous system that are actually estimating this future reward, this R sigma, and when, uh, I guess that would be this, this here, this would be the estimate of your future reward. And then when you actually get a future reward and it's different than what you estimated, you, uh, you fire uh, to, to strengthen those connections. Okay, so this is nice because it also, this at least TD0 is only looking one time step into the future. So you get your reward now and you get your, uh, your estimated reward one time step in the future. And so this is a somehow waiting events right before a reward takes place. So this is kind of a one delta t delay between an action and a reward, and that one delta t uh, delay, things that are correlated with one delta t will get strengthened in this TD0 framework. Okay, um, good, so I already told you about the strong connections to biological learning with dopamine. 
But it, you could expand this value function out, and this would be rk plus gamma rk plus 1 plus gamma squared, uh, maybe I'll write it out here, plus gamma squared of my value function two steps into the future. And I can do this as many times as I want. So this is kind of a two-step uh, expansion of my, of my value function using, again, the Bellman optimality. These are both completely equivalent to each other. And I can replace this estimate for r sigma with this longer expression that has two events in the past, that has two uh, action state sequences. And so if I do that, now I have uh, kind of a richer set of experiences of what my actual cumulative reward is, now taking two steps into the future. And I can use that as my, uh, to generate my, my temporal difference error signal that I use to update my, my value function. And you can imagine doing this as many times as you want. Um, you could have an n step cumulative reward. And in the limit, as n goes to infinity or to the end of your episode, this will actually converge to Monte Carlo learning, which is kind of neat. So at the very limit of temporal difference learning, as n goes to infinity or to the end of your sequence, this will converge uh, in some sense to Monte Carlo learning. But if I take you know, n equals 0 or 1 or 2, then I'm waiting only a few steps in the past more heavily uh, to update my value function. Good. So that's the idea of temporal difference learning. And um, let's see. I'm pretty sure the next thing I'm going to tell you about is probably, um, well, OK, in a minute, we're going to show you <laughs> that um, essentially Q learning is just temporal difference learning on the quality function Q. So I'll show you that in a minute. There's one last variant called TD lambda, and essentially what it does is it says instead of just using uh, a one-step temporal difference, TD0, or a two-step temporal difference, TD1, or an n-step temporal difference, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute that target, that R sigma, for all of those, and I'm going to weight them in a certain way uh, using this kind of uh, exponential weighting with some, some factor lambda that's between 0 and 1. OK, so essentially what I'm doing is I'm weighting all of the TD algorithms. And then I use that uh, weighted error um, reward signal to compute my TD error. And this has some nice, uh, some nice properties. You can kind of tune this lambda depending on the problem you're working on to get nice convergence properties to weight kind of recent stuff more or older stuff more. Um, but you're kind of weighting all of them instead of just ignoring um, past events. Good. So TD Lambda is pretty, pretty interesting. I believe this was introduced by Sutton um, originally. OK, so Q learning. This is kind of the culmination of what I really wanted to show you, is that Q learning is essentially just temporal difference learning on the Q function. So I'm going to write it out. OK, so Q, Q learning, it's, it's exactly the same template as temporal difference learning. We are going to play games. We're going to you know, do trial and error learning by trying our optimal policy. And we have an estimate of what the quality, given being in a, a state S taking action A is. But that's not a perfect estimate. We're, we're still learning. And so what we do is we measure what the actual reward and future Q function is at the next step we find ourselves in. And we use this as the TD target uh, for TD learning. So again, this is the, the TD target estimate. This is essentially my observed uh, cumulative reward. And I use that to generate an error signal, which I feed back to update my Q function. So essentially what this means is that if I got more reward than I thought I would, I should increase my Q function at that S and that A. Okay, so that's what that means. If I, if I experienced more reward than what I expected, I should have a positive increase in my quality function at that SK and AK. And you'll notice here, this is a very subtle difference. I'm going to say this again. Very subtle difference. Here, we're maximizing over A. So what we're actually doing is we, we take some step, we take some action A to get our reward RK. But it doesn't have to be our optimal on policy action AK. It could be, I could actually do some random action to get this RK. 
But then when I'm computing my quality function here for what my value kind of is in that next state, sk plus 1, we're going to optimize over actions a, at least to compute this td target. Now this is a little bit strange, but I'll tell you kind of what this means uh, in a minute, okay? So um, we call that off policy, which means that I can actually take suboptimal actions A. I don't have to enact my optimal current policy pi. I can take suboptimal actions A to get, this, uh, to get this reward, but then I do need to maximize over A to get my, my best uh, Q function in this step of the, of the TD target. Okay? And this has a lot of benefits which uh, essentially I can learn from experience. I can replay old experiences even when I know that those were not using an optimal policy pi because I've learned more since then. Or I can watch a grand master play and even if my quality function is not very good because I'm an amateur, I can watch their actions and learn from their actions. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but that, that essentially is what we mean by off policy is that you can still learn even if you take suboptimal actions A. Uh, and you'll notice that this is a TD0 variant because this is only taking one uh, step forward and then using the recursive Q formulation. Good. Um, there is a, another variant. So Q learning is off policy TD learning of the Q function. And there's something called SARSA, which is on policy TD learning of the Q function. Very closely related, only a tiny, tiny difference, but it's an important one and I'll tell you about it. So SARSA means state action reward state action. It basically means you start with a state action, you take a, you're in a state and you take an action, you measure a reward, and then you uh, are in another state and you take another action, okay, SARSA. And so here you'll notice that this is the exact same expression, the same exact uh, temporal difference learning expression, TD0, except here I am not doing a max over Q, uh, a max over A, in this part of the TD uh, estimate. And so what that means is that I actually have to be taking my best possible policy actions, uh, A, A, K plus one, uh, and A, K at every step, or else this will start to degrade uh, my estimate. Because the quality function, Q, is always my estimate of the quality of being in that next state taking that next action, assuming I do the best thing forever after, okay? And so if I don't plug into here my best possible A, and into here if I didn't take my best possible action AK to get this reward, then this will actually be a suboptimal estimate of my, my quality function, and it will start to degrade uh, as I iterate through. Very subtle difference, and I'll put them next to each other so you can see the difference. Uh, but this is what's called on policy, because you have to enact uh, the optimal policy for this to work, for this to converge and not degrade. One of the cool things about SARSA is that SARSA can actually work for any of the TD variants. I showed it for TD0 here, but you can do it for TD1, TD2, TDN, and you would basically just replace this TD target here with a more complex or rich expression uh, taking more steps. And again, if you think about this, what this means is that you have to take actual steps. You actually have to take actions and get that trial and error experience. And then you look back and you see, okay, well, what were my sequence of events and rewards? And you can use that to update your quality function after gaining that experience. Good. So, so uh, yeah, good. This is... Um, yeah, and you can essentially just replace this uh, TD target for the cumulative reward with any old uh, TD algorithm you like, TD0, TD1, TDN, or uh, the temporal difference lambda scheme I showed you a minute ago. Okay, and so this is on policy TD learning of the quality function Q. So I wanna show these kind of simultaneously next to each other so that we can compare and contrast because they are almost perfectly identical, okay? Except, again, Q learning is what's called off policy. And we enable Q learning to be off policy by replacing this one A K plus one here with a max over A here. Because again, the quality function and the value function are 
uh, always assuming you do whatever is optimal in the future. So they're always assuming that after the next step, you do the best thing forever after. So it's the optimal kind of quality of being in that state. And so if you didn't maximize over A here, then if you took an off policy A, a suboptimal action A, this would actually degrade your quality function over time. But because we are actually optimizing over A in our quality function at the next step, we can take suboptimal actions A to explore and to learn from off policy experiences. And again, this is a huge, huge benefit. So uh, this kind of off policy, this, this single difference here that allows us to be off policy is one of the things that allows Q learning to learn uh, from a lot of different types of experiences. So you can watch someone else play a chess game and still learn in an off policy manner. Even if your quality function is not as good as the grand masters that you're learning from, you can accumulate information about how they play and improve your quality function. Uh, so you can learn from imitation and you can also learn by replaying your past experiences, even if they were suboptimal. So when you go to sleep at night and you dream of playing tennis, even if you are replaying things that were not done perfectly because you've learned throughout the day, you can still use that experience to still improve uh, your quality function. And so the Q learning often is faster at learning because you can explore more. So you get better optimal solutions and faster convergence. Um, and oftentimes you get lower variance uh, solutions in, I'm, I'm sorry, I think this is higher variance. I think this is a typo. Uh, you'll have to check the book chapter because I'm pretty sure that's a typo. Um, okay, good. So. And when you do Q learning, there are lots of strategies for how you introduce randomness into the policy that for what action you take. So there's something called epsilon greedy, which basically means that one minus epsilon you know, of the time, so let's say epsilon is, is 0.05, then 95% of the time you would do your optimal policy, and 5% of the time you would do something random. You would do a random action to get more kind of exploratory actions to explore your space more. So that's an epsilon greedy algorithm. And in these epsilon greedy algorithms, often you start with a big epsilon. So you start by only doing random stuff. And then eventually that epsilon cools down to zero in a kind of annealing or simulated annealing strategy. So as you get more experience, as you learn better, you eventually get to go more on policy uh, as that epsilon decays to zero. So that's a really important one called epsilon greedy, but there's tons of, of different ways of introducing randomness and exploration uh, into your, your off policy search strategies. Okay, good. Uh, and in you know, contrast with SARSA, so it has some benefits also. So the benefits of SARSA is that it is often safer in training because it is always going to do what you think is the best thing to do. It's not going to randomly explore. So if you're teaching a teenager how to drive, you probably want to be doing something more like SARSA than Q learning because you don't want to just every epsilon, you know, flip a coin and decide on some random action that might take you off the road or have some safety uh, issue. So SARSA, because it's on policy, means you're always doing what you think is the best thing. Uh, even though it's more conservative. So this will um, learn less quickly and probably less optimally, but safer uh, while it's learning. And similarly, SARSA, because it's always on policy, it typically will maximize, it will have more cumulative rewards during the learning process. So if I, if I care about how much reward I get during my learning process, then SARSA will actually give me more cumulative reward because it's always on policy. It's not making these occasional kind of bad or suboptimal moves just to gain experience. And so it's an interesting trade-off, right? Like this actually has a lot of parallels with human life, as you might expect, and, and, and biological learning. Sometimes you want to be more conservative. Sometimes you want to maximize your rewards throughout the learning process. Sometimes you put a premium on being able to take chances and you know introduce some randomness and, and learn from experiences that are not what you think are the optimal experience. You know, go backpacking in Europe, right? That's a that's a Q learning uh, type of type of uh, action. Okay, good. Um, so what I hope I've convinced you of 
is that when you don't have a model for your MDP, for your markup decision process, there are things that are inspired by dynamic programming in Bellman's uh, equation. You can think of these almost as approximate dynamic programming based on trajectories of real world experiences. I actually take actions in the real world through trial and error, and I start to accumulate information that can give me a better worldview of what the quality of a, a given state action pair are. And there are off policy and on policy uh, variations of this that have different strengths and weaknesses. Okay. Good, uh, so that's what we talked about here, is kind of this gradient-free, uh, model-free reinforcement learning. Q-learning is used a lot uh, for deep reinforcement learning, and so I'll definitely talk about that in a future lecture. All right, stay tuned, uh, there's more to come. Thank you.